Hi, I'm Gary Bates, and today I'm joined by Joel Tay, one of my creationist colleagues who actually has a degree in evolutionary biology. How's that? Thank you, Gary. So, Gary, today we're going to、um, address an interesting topic today. Yeah, well, the Black Lives Matters movement obviously has been、uh, very prominent in the media all around the world, and it's become synonymous with what, what's called the cancel culture. And we'll talk a little bit about that later.、Uh, but today, the Black Lives Movement and people in general, I think they link slavery or racism rather、yes. with the slavery movement, particularly here in the US and in the UK,、uh, where obviously slavery was was abolished.、Uh, Quite a long time ago, we're seeing statues torn down around the world of slave traders or anyone that was involved in slavery、mm. uh, at all, and the historical context is being viewed as as racist. We're going to put a bit of diff- a different slant on that. Now, let me set this up because I want folks to listen carefully here, and we'll probably pop up a slide so you can get the dates in order. I'm going to read this out. Darwin's original. Book on the origin of species was published in 1859.、Mm. That was 20 years la- after slavery was abolished in the British Empire. That was 1833. In his second book, *The Descent of Man*, where he really argued for the evolution of man, and he postulated that the so-called dark-skinned races were less evolved and closer to the apes, as he thought, that was published in 1871. All、right, thirty-eight years after the abolition ab- abolition of slavery in the British Empire, and six years after the Thirteenth Amendment in the United States, which abolished slavery. That's more than one generation. So, yeah. Yeah. So clearly,、um, slavery was abolished before Darwin had even developed these theses, right? Yes. And what's interesting is that Charles Darwin, even though he was very racist, he was actually against slavery. And we can talk a little bit about that later on. Yeah, one of the most、um, leading evolutionists in the last century,、um, Stephen Jay Gould,、um, he actually wrote about this. He says that biological, I quote him, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. The litany is familiar. Cold, dispassionate, objective modern science show us that races can be ranked on a scale of superiority. If this offends Christian morality or a sentimental belief in human unity, so be it. Science must be free to proclaim unpleasant truths. I think what's interesting in this quote is that Stephen Jay Gould he's against racism, but he's an evolutionist,、yeah. right? And and he yes, <laughs> and he admits that racism increased after the eighteen fifties. That is after Charles Darwin published his book in eighteen fifty nine, and he also recognized something. He says that racism and evolution contradicts Christianity. All forms of racism is wrong. We subscribe to that absolutely. The Bible says we are created in God's image. All humanity is closely related and descended back to Adam. That's our basis. But if evolution is true,、mm-hmm. the theory is correct. Humans have evolved from you know what they call ape-like creatures,、uh, and over hundreds of thousands of years, the belief is that some people groups are going to evolve. Or be you know to be vastly superior、mm-hmm. than other groups. The struggle for survival only benefits the advancement of the human race. So many of these white supremacy groups、mm-hmm. you actually see are actually steeped in evolutionary thinking, and 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 consequences. We've kind of seen that infect the church in some areas too. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the case. The Ku Klux Klan, for example, you know, heavy on evolution because of this whole idea of. Superior races and things like that. Okay, so interestingly, if you look at some of the most notorious、um, dictators in the last century, right? So we have Adolf Hitler, Karl Marx, Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong in China,、uh, Mussolini, Lenin, Francis Galton. He's the founder of eugenics. We have、yeah. Margaret Sanger. That's the founder of Planned Parenthood. They all share one thing in common. Do you want to tell us what that is? Oh well,、uh, Darwin was one of their favourite authors. I mean, you know, so the whole basis there of、uh, even adding selection to their own people groups. I mean, Hitler did this. Obviously, he believed that some races were inferior. And I remember looking at a, a quote in my、uh, my daughter's、um, history book, and there was this quote、uh, by Hitler. He said, "Struggle is the father of all things, 
It is not by the principles of humanity that man lives or is able to preserve himself above the animal world, but solely by the means of the most brutal struggle. He who would live must fight. He who doesn't want to wish to fight in this world where permanent struggle is the law of life has not the right to exist. And he uh, exterminated in the concentration camps, I think, over 70,000 of his own people, Germans, who mm -hmm. were mentally handicapped. In our uh, documentary, Evolution's Achilles Heels, we have uh, a propaganda movie from the Nazi party during the Second World War saying, um, showing handicapped people. Uh, they, you know, obviously they were drooling, and et cetera, and they called them drooling imbeciles. We must not allow them to exist, the idea that they would pollute the gene pool somehow. So these Darwinian ideas have affected several levels of society. But let's get back to this idea of racism. We, we kind of said, was there a link to slavery or whatever before? Mm -hmm. Explain to us the hum human zoo concept. Okay, so early in the last century, in like um, most of the big cities in the world, they have what we call human zoo. And um, these are places where you have people of different races from all over the world, and you're placed in zoos as exhibits. And the purpose of this is kind of like a living laboratory where you can go to the zoo, you can observe the different stages of human evolution. So they would view the other non-white races as lower stages of human evolution. And um, one of the most famous of these exhibits is this guy by the name of uh, Otabenga. And you have wrote, yeah. wrote about that as well. So Otabenga, he's a 23-year-old pygmy from Congo. So it's very short, but it, if you, yeah. you know me, I'm, I'm not tall myself. So if <laughs> Otabenga were to stand beside me, you know, he's just, he's just this, uh, about here. He's not that short, yeah. right? So he's married twice, he had children of his own, but he was brought um, to the United States first at the St. Louis World Fair in 1904. And later yep. on, they brought him back in 1906, and this was in the Bronx Zoo. Uh, leading evolutionists were actually behind this. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah. They believed, as in our own my own country of Australia, that you know at the time Australian Aboriginals were, you know, closer. You know, might be missing links. You know, for as the common vernacular says. Uh, but William Hornaday, who was the director of the Bronx Zoo where Ota Benga was displayed. He said he was a genuine African pygmy belonging to a sub-race mm. commonly miscalled the dwarfs. Mm. Madison Grant was a leading racist at the time. He was the author of a book called The Passing of the Great Race, which Hitler called his Bible. Yes. And he said a rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak uh, or unfit. And so when Odebenga was put on display, he was actually put in the monkey house along with other apes. And tens of thousands of people came to visit the exhibit because he was actually exhibited as, you know, one of these kind of evolutionary missing links. And here's the point I think you were getting at. Last year, I wrote an article because the Wildlife Conservation Society, which <laughs> runs the Bronx Zoo in New York, yes. issued an apology. Now, listen to this, folks. They said, we deeply regret that many people and generations have been hurt by these actions or our failure to uh, previously to publicly condemn and denounce them. We recognize that overt and systematic racism persists and our intention must be to play a greater role to confront it. And of course, they were talking about the exhibit of Otabenga and the practices that they had done. But they talked about racism, but racism wasn't the problem why Otabenga was displayed in the zoo, was it? Yeah, that's right. It was evolution. It was the science of the day, so to speak. You know, by Ota Benga's time, slavery had already been abolished in the United States for more than 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. Yeah, that's 40 a, that's years. That's a long, long time. time right? in a, in Almost a two lifetime. generations. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and Darwin's view actually gave rise to eugenics. So um, his cousin, Francis Galton, he's, he's known as, uh, as the father of eugenics. And Darwin's three sons were actually heavily involved in the eugenics movement as well. And eugenics, um, they used to, Darwin used to describe eugenics as the self-direction of human evolution. That means he tried to put yeah. human evolution into practice. And so eugenics, yes. it wasn't a fringe movement. Huh? When we talk about eugenics, people tend to think it's always oh, something of there in the distant past. But it wasn't a fringe movement. During that time, it was the consensus view of evolutionists in the early 20th century. Well, Hitler would be the classic eugenicist, wasn't he? Yes, he was that's trying right. to grab lands and breed what he believed a master race. We know about 
obviously the awful experiments that were conducted on uh, interns and prisoners in the concentration camps, for example. So um, all of this stemmed from this Darwinian view. And as we said, in The Descent of Man, uh, the idea that uh, we, we, you know, that so-called the dark-skinned races were lower on the evolutionary scale. Now, one of the first documentaries we made at Creation Ministries International was Darwin, The Voyage That Shook the World. And we retraced his voyage of the Beagle. We went to Tierra del Fuego. We interviewed evolutionists and creationists, um, et cetera. And in it, there was a kind of a social experiment that Darwin did. When he went to Tierra del Fuego on the very tip of South America, at the tip of Tierra del Fuego, there was uh, indigenous people. They were wearing it's a pretty cold place. They were wearing skin cloaks, living in kind of teepees, et cetera. And he took four people back to England. And uh, one of them, Jemmy Button, he educated him, right? Tried to refine him in English ways. And then later returned him back to Tierra del Fuego, hoping that his civilized ways would kind of infect the local population when rise their, you know, raise their standard. But then when he went back years later, he, he kind of described them as they returned <laughs> to savagery. In fact, I think he says there, Darwin described them as savages and barbarians. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In fact, I think by the time he wrote his second book, right, um, Darwin wondered if the non-white races, you know, they had the capacity to be elevated yeah. properly to civilized human beings. So he thought that they were not able to do that. They were morally, mentally at a different, a more limited level, so to speak. Yeah. Now, we should make a point here too, Joel, that slavery has not just been in the realm of black people, dark-skinned races. Every race has kind of enslaved another you know, race yes. at, some, at some stage in history. But obviously, we're more familiar in recent times, particularly with you know, uh, slavery in the United States and in the UK. Now, we mentioned at the beginning that in this cancel culture, you know, statues are being torn down around the world. Let me just make a point here. There is one founding belief that really caused the major discrimination against the non-white races in the world, and it was evolution. Yes. I don't recall seeing Darwin's statue being ripped down anywhere recently, do you? No, not a single one. <laughs> There's one case, the closest I can think of an incident where he where Darwin was kind of erased in, in a sense, was actually in, in a museum. Yes, the British Natural History Museum. Yeah. It's, a, it's one of the world's most famous museums, in fact, yeah. Yeah, so um, they kind of removed the display that showed that Darwin was racist, right? But they were not really can cancelling Darwin, right? They did not remove Darwin. They just removed the parts. They make him out to be racist. In other words, they okay. were actually kind of whitewashing his evil, make him look better than what he is. But, but hang on. So they acknowledged Darwin was racist. Yes. Right? His family was involved in eugenics. He was wrong about that. So will they remove the parts about Darwin that showed that he was racist, Yeah. but not his evolutionary theory. But hang on. Why was he racist? Because of because evolution. Of, yes. Because of evolutionary theory. There's a massive inconsistency there. You know, at CMI, uh, it's interesting. For years, even when it was sometimes unpopular, we've always maintained there is one race. Yes, the human. The, hu the human race, because the Bible's history says we all go back to Adam. The Bible says from one man he made all nations of men. And people can look at creation.com and they can find that the so-called racial differences you know, occupy or present even less than 1% yes. of the information in our human genome. What I am always concerned about, Joel, is that we erase even the unpleasant parts of history. Yeah, that's I right. mean, what if, we, what if we erased Hitler and people never ever knew about the atrocities Hitler did or Stalin in killing tens of millions of people, of his own people? Uh, famous philosopher George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are, are doomed, doomed to repeat it. Yes. And let me make a bold statement, because for me personally, I've spoken about a lot about this at, a, at events. To me, the only answer to racism is Jesus Christ. Yes, the gospel. Because if, yes, because the Bible recognizes the equality of humans everywhere around the world. And when you try to invoke or force a policy onto someone and their, their mind and their heart is not geared or ready to accept it, 
they're not going to. It's as simple as that. And it's only when we have a heart change, I believe, and you look outside and you see your your black brother or your Asian brother or whatever, and you realize that he is also made in God's image. Surely that's the basis of our equality as, as a human race. Yes, that's right. In fact, I like to say that regarding this cancer culture, as Christians, we must have a very different approach. Well, let's cancel the cancer culture. Let's instead, <laughs> you know, instead of having a cancer culture, let's have a forgiveness culture, right? That's what the Bible says. We are all sinners. Yeah. We are all in need of forgiveness. We all need Christ. And we all need to believe in the gospel. And like you say, the answer the, is the gospel. The answer to racism is the gospel. And even yeah. dealing with this whole Black Lives Matter issue, it's important because if we do not understand that the justification for racism comes from evolution, if we keep pinning it on slavery, if you identify the wrong issue, you have the wrong solution. Yeah, you're dealing with the symptoms. Yes, yeah, that's another way to say it, yeah. Yeah, the symptoms instead of the foundational uh, problems. Absolutely. Mistakes have been made in history. People all over the world have uh, oppressed others. And again, it all comes, I think, from a lack of a Christian worldview that uh, recognizes people. And I know uh, just as we go, some people will say, hey, the Bible talks about slavery, et cetera, and so on. And we don't have time to talk about that today, but we've got lots of articles um, about that. And the most important thing to recognize in all of this is we talked about the abolition of slavery in England and so on. Who were the major abolitionists against slavery? It wasn't evolutionists. It was Christians, yeah. It was Christians, and it was the Bible that inspired uh, their motive. So thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy and learn something new. Maybe get a new perspective on this whole cancer culture and slavery issue and recognize that, you know, that the gospel is the answer. There are a few books I would like to recommend. Of course, the first um, is One Human Family. We actually have a book. Well, um, I think in most of our bookstores, we actually sell the electronic book. This deals yeah. a lot with the human zoo and some of the cultural issues that we talk about today. And we also have a DVD here on the very same thing, One Human Family by the same title. And this has been priced so that you can actually buy this in bulk and give it off to your friends. You can make yeah. a difference. Change the way that they look at this whole issue of slavery, Black Lives Matter and things like that. If you're interested to explore more about um, Hitler and Darwin, we have a few things. We have a DVD called Evolution and the Holocaust. And this is where you can actually see some of the videos that were shown during his time where they use evolution as a justification for what he's doing. Another one here, Hitler and the Nazi Darwinian worldview. So these are a few books I recommend and thank you and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye.